And there is no English version of Te Tariti. There is only Te Tariti. Okay? Remind me about contra preferentum too, please. I'll bring that up. So anyway, what we did was by doing that, was having reinstated and remembered ourselves, we, informed, as I say, formed Elizabeth, and we found it rather interesting that now we've got England happening in Brexit, you know, doing Brexit, because England could not stay in the European Union and uphold Te Tariti. If you have an agreement of the parties, which is law, and neither party is upholding the agreement. You don't have an agreement. Huh? Got a worthless piece of paper. But because we had proclaimed our honouring and in upholding of Te Tiriti, then the other party must come to the fore. Otherwise, the agreement can be ruled null and void, and all profit gains and advantages of an agreement or contract ruled null and void become the property of the aggrieved party, which would be us, because we're in order. Okay? You need to be in order in order to give an order. Okay. The universe operates in an order. Okay. So that was one of the interesting things we had. Then we communicated with her again, and we received a response from the Lord Chancellor. Uh, communicated with her again and said that we were being pirated. That there appeared to be a false government operating in her name, which many of you have heard of Her Majesty the Queen in right of New Zealand. Yeah, creature of statue, listed on Brudden Bread in Dunn Street. Um, you know, on the Security and Exchange Commission. So it's just a creature of statute, that's all. Uh, which I actually uh, just appear to be a bunch of pirates or privateers who are operating under a letter of mark, which is very interesting, because I'll just digress a little bit. Who remembers the flag debacle? The changing of the New Zealand flag? Well, Mr. Key didn't have any authority to change the New Zealand flag anyway, because it's not his realm. But he does appear to be CEO of the privateers here, for various reasons. Anyway, people have often asked the questions, why did we have all these competitions about what flag we might like to have before we'd even decided whether we were going to change the flag? Because that doesn't seem, that's like ill logic, eh? Oh, let's decide what we flag we'll have should we choose to change it. Why don't we just decide whether we're going to change the damn thing first, then we'll spend the money on what we might like to have. Because it was nothing to do with changing the flag. It's all about an old, old law called the International Law of Privateers. Pirates with a letter of mark, right? Privateers. You can sail under a false flag, but before the first shot is fired, you must raise your true colours. In other words, you must give your full disclosure before you aggress upon another. You've all seen it on movies. Two ships come along. Oh, it's one of ours. Come alongside. Down goes one flag. Up goes the Jolly Roger. Bang, bang, bang. Why do you think that flag was flying off the Harbour Bridge? Because it made an international statement. Because it's the only logical reason that it was done in that order. See, when you go into an educational system or an indoctrination system, you're not taught how to think logically. You're taught what to parrot. So we are not taught how to think. You're taught what to think. And this is part of the paradigm shift in the way we think about things is applying logic. Apply the edge of logic to a situation and you will chip away to the truth. And this is why we say in order to give an order, one need to be in order because what it does is order provides structure and it provides foundation of, from which to build from. If you don't have your foundation in order, then you can bet your footy is not going to be too flash. So... The term order, often when you say talk about order, people think about giving orders, commands. Those are commands. Right? Order is um, probably better defined as um, a system of stability. Okay, first off, comprehend what they are. You know, but all they, all they are, if you might say, 1835 is uh, the recipe, a mechanism, it's a, it's, a, it's a code of conduct. It's just, so how you enact it? Well, how do you think you could live in honour of the Creator and be of service to all humanity? You know, see some old folks struggling with a door, open the door for them, that's a service to humanity. I mean, doing this is service. That's what I see. Thank you for the opportunity to be of service. You know? Um... 
bringing it to light. You know, more and more be- people are becoming aware of it and they are putting their light to it. So it's becoming more and more. I mean, one of the greatest things was over the flag thing, changing the flag. I've never seen so many Waka Putanga flags flying over that there. You know? So um, enactment, first off, lay your foundation. This is who I am. This is what I stand for. This is the code I live to. And, I'm, and, and that's what we call your turanga waiwai. Your proclamation is your place to stand. So before you come aligned with the proclamation of sovereign state, get your own ship together. This is what a lot of people need to do. They really need to get their ships together, like your vessel I'm talking about. Get that together, okay? And then you can progress from that. So that lays your, the proclamation lays your foundation for doing that, and then you enact it. And if you fall off or fall overboard or whatever, pick yourself up, get back on board, make your apologies, make your atonement to bring it back into harmony, and keep paddling. The significance of the Constitution. Well, as we stated, 1835 is not only a proclamation, a constitutional document. It lays down where the authority and where the responsibilities lie. That's what constitution is. Well, as many of you will have heard, you know, a lot of these countries, like Australia and Canada, spring to mind, which are both under control of the same band of um, privateers, we'll use the polite word, privateers is what this country is under, have thrown away their constitutions. Not that they lawfully could do that, you know, uh, but they have. Um, now, it actually opens up an amazing opportunity, but what literally they've done is they've thrown away their means of governance, if you like, because they're now adopting the World Health Organization international constitution, which, of course, is New World Order, which is all about depopulation and you know, further enslavement. Colonization. Colonization is just a polite term for enslavement. I think it's probably more along the lines of colonization, because I think they're full of shit, actually, to put it quite bluntly. Because, <laughs> look, I mean, they don't know what they do. If they knew what they were doing, they would not do it, because literally they're condemning their own souls to another cycle through even lower dimensional realities than this one. Okay? So constitution. We have a constitution. Thank goodness some of us were understood what was put in place for us, and we reinstated that back in 2015. Now, this is why Jacinda said she was going to lead the world out, because this was going to be the first slave country. And we were supposed to go into massive, massive lockdowns, because it was going, because if it all turned to crap, we are a little on small population. But we've always punched, as they say, punched above our weight. You wonder why? Because we're the ascendants of great people. We're the ascendants of sovereign minds that had some really good smarts, right? So we have a constitution. The realm of New Zealand has a constitution. The start of its constitution is Te Tiriti o Waitangi, and then, of course, it relies upon things like the Magna Carta and other things to make up its constitution. They cannot throw away our constitution. They might like to think they can, but they can't. So it's important we held on to our constitution and it's important that we reinstated it, remembered it and reinstated it, particularly for these times. Where this is creating a massive opportunity is because Australia's thrown away its Commonwealth constitution, Canada's thrown away its, and a whole heap of other countries, is that the native peoples of those areas, when three gather in the Creator's name, an ahika, someone who keeps the home fires burning, right? Arangatira, or a chief, who holds the responsibility not to tell uh, the tribe, the hapu, what to do, but to see that the will of the tribe or the hapu is done. That's the responsibility of a chief or arangatira. Not a corporate structure here. Okay? And then a kamata, where in three gather in the creator's name, great things happen. So they can create their clan, their tribe, their hapu, pro, make their covenant with the creator, put in their proclamation, proclamation of sovereign state, and then request and become part of Kōtewa coming on the hapu or Nūtereni, because Nūtereni is global in scope. 
And they can now step under an internationally and take on board an internationally recognised constitution, which will stop them to a great deal being enslaved and pirated upon because they have a constitution. Not being forced into a constitution that is someone else's. This is why legislation can never override human rights because it says so in the human rights. Okay? How could you make a rule of an association override a, a, a most fundamental right? Everybody, Section 28 or Article 28, 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, everybody has the right to social and international order so that you can live peacefully and harmoniously with each other. Okay? Good old number 28 again. Most powerful piece of New Zealand legislation. Now, if it is in the Bill of Rights Act, who's read the Bill of Rights Act? A little bit more homework for those who are lacking. Good on you. Right? Educate yourselves. Okay? Nobody's going to do it for you. Okay? If you were putting in a Bill of Rights, which that came into being in 1990, you would think logically that the first right would state that an existing right you still have. I mean, that would be logical, wouldn't it? Well, in that particular document, it's not the first section. It's actually section 28, where it says an existing right or freedom shall not be seen to be abrogated or restricted just because it does not appear in whole or in part in this legislation. 28 resonates through the legislation. Bear in mind that as long as the cult has been usurping our ship of state and usurping these ships of state all around the world, so too has the sovereign order been at work. It's just that we operate to a different code. Part of our code is never the aggressor be. We cannot drag you through the gate. We can just show you there is a door open for you. But only you can choose to walk through it. Thy will be done. Okay? So you'll find 28 often. Another piece, very powerful piece of legislation that binds the Crown, Criminal Procedures Act, Section 28. A constable or any other person, pretty much, can, uh, if they suspect criminal behaviour, can lay a charge. Didn't know you had that right, did you? Yeah. So this is where we need to bring to order the constabulary. A lot of the constabulary is out of the control. It's actually gone from constabulary and keeping the peace into policy enforcement, enforcing the policies of the Crown Corporation and enforcing that policy upon us. Okay? And one of the most obvious charges that one could lay is in the Crimes Act is section 228, so we'll call that a double 28 just to get your attention, taking or using a document to gain a pecuniary or to gain an advantage, particularly a pecuniary advantage. Who pays rates here? Who thinks they own their own land? Well, we'll divest you of that one because you don't. All you have is a title of usage. So who thinks that the council has an authority to rate you and compel you to belong to its association? Because hmm. you're not living on their land. They're the public servant. They're there to provide the services. Right? So who's ever got an infringement notice? Under the Land Transport Act, Act binds the Crown. Oh, I must have to pay this because somebody in a uniform gave it to me. Nah. Right? But you have a responsibility to behave. That's why if you'll see on a speeding ticket, it says the recommended speed limit. The alleged offence. But because you're never educated, you're indoctrinated, you're thinking, oh, should I got one of those? I'd better pay for it. No. Just go... But you need your proclamation in place. No? And then you present your proclamation. Can you now please show how I'm a member of the Crown? Because I'm telling you I'm not. Can you prove I'm a member of the Crown? Because this legislation binds the Crown. Now, if I was doing something dumb, like doing donuts down by a school or something, then the constabulary have a right because you are potentially going to create an offence against the peace. And they have a right to go, oh, tie hot. There's a potential breach of the peace here or offence against the peace. This is how we keep the peace, what we call peace and good order. 
Okay? So when they hang to a, if you've got your proclamation, you can make the call whether you want to battle away with it or not. I mean, that's entirely up to you. You just go, please prove your claim. You are now, you're making a presumption. I am a member of the Crown. I thrice deny your presumption. Here's my proclamation. Can you now please prove your claim that I am under your authority and therefore I am bound by your legislation, the rules of your association? Because under 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 20 bar 2, I cannot be compelled to join an association. It includes in land revenue. Who pays income tax? Why? Why? Who's read the 1994 Tax Administration Act? Okay. Did you notice the little kicker in it? It's one of the only acts that does not bind the crown. The other one is the 1990 Bill of Rights because that binds the legislative, executive and judicial branches of government. That's why they cannot override it, particularly Section 11 about medical, receiving medical. So a lot of people never read these things because you know people say there is nothing shorter than death and tax as well. If you've got time, I'll debate both issues with you. you know, there's nothing shorter than death by taxes. <laughs> So I just did what any you know, person would do. I just wrote in a notice, you know, or received a notice. It's a, it's a polite way of communicating. I just wrote in a notice to the Commissioner of Inland Revenue, notice of understanding and intent, that it was my understanding that tax is voluntary, income tax is voluntary, and therefore my intent was to um, disperse the fruits of my endeavours as and where I see fit. They agreed in a roundabout sort of way but they sent me back a communication going blah, blah, blah. It was a couple of pages of compostable verbiage, but there was one little sentence that made very good sense, and that was said, Inland Revenue provides all sorts of tools and blah, blah, blah for people to ascertain their tax obligations on a voluntary basis. Because in the 1994 Tax Administration Act, it says the Commissioner's job is to promote compliance, especially voluntary compliance. What does voluntary mean? Of free will. What does compliance mean? Act in a prescribed manner. Who's bound by the act? Those who voluntarily choose to comply. So I just wrote it and I said, therefore I voluntarily choose not to comply. If you can show how I'm obligated to pay you anything in any way, shape or form, please do so or forever keep the peace. Until my understanding is refuted to an exacting point of law, it prevails in truth and law. They still haven't taken me to court over it. However, they did send me a notice one day that they were going to audit me. And when you get a notice, you need to take notice of it because it's a polite way of conversing with people. And also you get the great opportunity to respond and go, thank you for your notice. Please notice my notice, noticing your notice. <laughs> I'm not paying any tax. People go, oh, yeah, but you want to use the roads, you want to use the hospitals, you want to use this. Well, this just shows people's total lack of understanding about fiat currencies, fractional banking, and piracy. Because the best I've been able to work out is that no income tax paid in this country stays in this country. It's all going offshore to the pirates. The only tax that stays here is your excise taxes, GST, and your tobacco and petrol tax. Now, was it an injury? Who remembers when GST went up to 15%? Hmm, who remembers the old government snatch tax here? Who remembers Bill English saying, if we do not raise GST to 15%, every man, woman, and child in this country will owe $32,000? I went, oh dear, Bill, do you realise what you've just admitted to? You're running a slave ship. How can a child born today owe money? It's through a very nefarious form of slavery called debt bondage, which just happens to be in the Section 98, 1961 Crimes Act, Act Binds the Crown. I think that's Section 408 in that Act. You know? They're running a slave ship. They openly admit it. Whether they do it consciously or not is yet to be determined, but the fact they said it, can't unsay it, can you? 